Hi, Alex. Good to see hey, you today. Karen. Good to see you too. Hey, uh, I've been thinking about something Paul Vanderclay said the other day, and um, it's a quote that I want to talk about in the context of entropy. Okay. You ready to talk about entropy? Absolutely. That's a great topic. Yeah. Okay. So what Paul Vanderclay said was, materiality is a medium of communication. So what does that say to you? <laughs> That's profound. Um, materia materiality is a means of communication or a mode of communication. To me, it says something about, it's like a, a commentary on the symbol, on the definition of a symbol, um, or it's another way of defining a symbol. So a symbol is something that you, that can be something real and material, but it doesn't um, explicitly convey information like a sign does. Like a stop sign says, it's conveying this information that says stop. Mm -hmm. And a symbol can literally be anything, but it's dependent on the person, the person's um, interaction with that thing and the, the meaning that they assign to it. Um, and there's, there's something about what, where does that meaning that you assign to the symbol come from that's really mysterious, but seems to have this, um, a structure and an order to it, but also something that is um, benevolent. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. it's, that whatever that symbol is telling you isn't isn't telling you a lie or it's not steering you down the wrong path wow well i want to cycle back to that idea that's very it the synchronicity is just killing me because it <laughs> it it pulls back around to a concept that i was thinking about with the idea of poetic language versus scientific language mm. And I want, so I want to cycle back to that after we have our, a little bit of a discussion about entropy. Okay, uh, sounds good. So I ran into a video the other day that was describing entropy in a new way. So rather than talking about it as um, a way of uh, measuring disorder, um, this video said, actually think of it more in terms of the maximum entropy is when something is spread out to its maximum extent. Mm -hmm. and, and the example that he used is uh, if you have a cup of coffee and it's hot, mm -hmm. the, the heat spreads out to the cup and then to the air and, and eventually dissipates. And, and, and it's that spreading out that's moving towards maximum entropy so that the more it is spread out, the more entropy there is. Does mm -hmm. that sound right? Yeah, I think entropy, it, I think that definition sort of, and I'm no expert on it, but it seems like that definition is sort of coming up against the, um, what's difficult about that concept, because <laughs> there's this idea of order and disorder, mm -hmm. uh, so that if you have um, if you have a bunch of chaos, or things that don't make sense, then you can say that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of potential for information in that. Mm -hmm. So um, when you have a lot of chaos, do you think of that as maximum entropy or minimum entropy? Well, I think it would be helpful to to like read a definition of what sort of the standard definition of entropy is to sort of like, so that we're thinking of it in the same way. Well, there, I, I'm not been able to find a standard definition. Of <laughs> but I was looking at, uh, I was looking at a discussion of entropy in terms of the calculations. And um, 
I ran across this, that maximizing entropy minimizes the amount of prior information built into the distribution. So I'll say that again. Maximizing entropy minimizes the amount of prior information built into the distribution. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, yeah, yeah, here's, yeah. here's what that made me think about. And that is that I, I heard another discussion, or maybe it was a comment that I read someplace, that if, if you could imagine a situation in which the universe instead of being the way it is now if it if every particle in the universe were equidistant so basically there wouldn't be any planets or solar systems or people or anything just all of our particles would each be equidistant mm -hmm. so in one sense you could think of that as some kind of perfect order mm -hmm. but in another sense that is the situation in which there is um um the a minimum amount of prior information built into the distribution there's no mm -hmm. there's no um there's no potential information in that system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah right? but a system that's beautifully organized like like our universe that that has a lot of information in it right yeah so so there's something very mysterious here um that so the idea that i got was that perhaps this idea of of spread outness every particle being equidistant really is maximum entropy but in that situation where it's all spread out there is also a minimum amount of information available right. but does that mean that the information has already been gained from it as it's dissipating see that's where i get yep. confused and I think it's you're right to be confused. It confuses me too. And I think it's it. I may be I may be wrong, but I think it comes up against this paradox. It's paradoxical. That's why it's hard to understand. And then, so you have say the idea of a perfect a perfect crystal. Let's just take you know something a a, a small simple closed system like a crystal, like a calcite crystal, for example. Okay. And you've got a very, a very distinct stacking pattern of, um, of atoms in that crystal that makes it form into this nice um, cube. These cubes are of crystal, these crystals that have nice even sides, and mm -hmm. it's not chaotic at all. So you could say that in order for something so ordered. To come into existence so precise and ordered then there must have been some sort of information involved to form that crystal so perfectly and at the same time the definition of entropy suggests that that perfect crystal is a result of everything dissolving into no distinction n nothing at all no contrast no no potential for energy or information to be exchanged so like it so you're saying that you heard this definition where the greatest amount of entropy would be a perfectly a perfect distribution of all the particles in the universe mm -hmm. is that right well, I don't know if that was the definition of entropy. Okay. That was a thought question. Oh, okay. Like, um, well, first of all, I think the author of that comment was positing a thought question about if that were the situation, then gravity mm -hmm. would not work. None of the none of the laws of the universe would be functional, so the entire universe yeah. couldn't possibly exist in that situation. Yeah. But I got to thinking about that as that's also a maximum spread outness. Um, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Everything is as spread out from everything else as it can potentially be. But yes. then if that's maximum entropy, that would also, should also mean the maximum amount of information that is available. From mm -hmm. what I understand about information entropy theory, that yes. when something is at its most chaotic, it's 
got the most information available. Yes. But, but if every crazy. particle, so the, here's the paradox, if every particle is maximally spread out, then it would require, it seems like it would require perfect organization for every particle to be exactly equidistant from every other particle, so. <laughs> yeah, th thank you, that's, good. that's you, you're saying it that better than I'm saying it. But yeah, that's, I think that is, it's a paradox in a way. And I use the calcite crystal because that's what came to mind as something that's the most ordered with these, you know, sort of equidistant atoms. And mm -hmm. um, that's why I kind of went to that example. Um, but it, yeah, it seems so, like. So, so in a crystal like that, when it's um, perfectly ordered to create that little crystal, then, then there's no information available because the system is now complete. Is that the idea that, that there's no chaos available? Yeah, I think you could look and say, I mean, we're, there, there's, it's such a deep subject and there's so like if, if we had a, a, a physicist an astrophysicist or somebody like that, sitting with us they could tell us all kinds of things about <laughs> whatever we said that wouldn't be you know there would be some explanation or but it i heard this one physicist talking about it the other day something about this the contra the the paradox that we're intuiting and it had something to do with and he was trying to explain it to another physicist and that and even that physicist was having a hard time understanding it and this one guy had spent his entire career on this one question so but it had something to do with the with the newtonian physics and quantum physics and how you have you know say two objects out in space and they're they're interacting according to newtonian type of physics and ex mm -hmm. ex momentum and the, the laws of thermodynamics apply but there's something about the at, in the quantum realm when you start to talk about quantum reality of things that that breaks down mm -hmm. um, or at least it it changes the way it, it, it manifests itself so I think you have to start thinking about it you have to, I guess, define what you mean by particle and what you mean by distribution. Because in the quantum world, there's this thing called non-locality mm -hmm. where in, in probability where things really aren't anywhere at, in, um, until we observe them. Until they're observed, yeah. Yeah. So then I think that's the realm of information that we're, maybe that's what, sort of what we're talking about. Um, what we've been talking about is more of this realm of information. And if you try to apply Newtonian physics to information, I think there's at some level where that breaks down and you come in, you come to this paradox or this conundrum <laughs> and, and maybe it's better to try to look at it in terms of the, uh, the quantum aspect of information. Well, if I go back to what you said about the quantum aspect of non-locality and something not really being anywhere until you observe it, yeah. what popped into my mind was opportunity cost in economics. Huh. Okay. You familiar with that concept? So if I could say what I understand it to be, is that where you have any decision you make is a decision you didn't make. So the the decision you the thing you commit to is a, is also something that you leave something undone that wasn't some opportunity that wasn't uh, realized that you forfeited yes exactly so i mean okay. any any choice i mean really it comes down to even when uh, jordan peterson is talking about how every moment we're confronted with an infinite field of potential and we move through that infinite field of potential on some path, how do we navigate that path? But, but it requires a choice. So every choice that we make immediately says that all the other infinite possible choices are not being made. So it sounds to me, it's very like this idea of non-locality. It, it's just, 
it's the way that we, in a sense, our choices create reality in front of us as we move forward. My reality gets created by every choice that I make. And that, and the reality of my past consists of all the choices that I made in the past, all, mm. all the thoughts that I thought and all the books that I read and all the things that I did and all the people that I met and all of that creates up this, the substance of who I am, which is me from this moment into the past and me from this moment into the future. It consists of every choice I make from now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Um, my future doesn't exist except in potential, right? Mm-hmm. Right, right. It seems to me it's the same kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I, I see. I see that. I do. There's something about you know the the concept of emergence, and when you say that. my my reality is a, a consequence of my past decisions and and whatever is coming at me and how I decide to handle that or how I decide to deal with that will determine my future i I don't disagree with that at all um, and it seems like there's something else there as well mm-hmm. though that is this and that I think the concept of emergence is um addresses that to some degree and that's this idea that it's been i think it's been fairly well proven that how our minds work is that we experience something and then we look back at it and come up with the story to explain that thing that just happened and so we have a very rear view mirror type of um, I mean, I think most people do, and it's mm-hmm. by nature, the but the structure of the mind. So I think there was this, um, I don't remember the exact name of the experiment or who did the experiments, but there was something about a, a patient that had really severe epilepsy, and they, um, the only way to deal with it, because they were suffering so much, and it, you know, it was no way to live and it would have killed them. So they did this radical surgery to sem- separate the hemispheres of the brain. And I think it's called a corpus callosectomy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Seriously, That's, yeah. It's when they, yeah, so, when they cut the fiber bundle of the corpus callosum. Corpus yeah. callosum, the part that connects the two halves of the brain. Mm-hmm. And uh, you, you're probably familiar with this, but there was a, this experiment where they would cover the eye, one eye of the patient as they were sitting at a table, let's say they covered one eye so they could only see through this eye. Mm-hmm. And they put a put a Coke can there in front of them on the table. I'm kind of paraphrasing it. I don't know, it might've been Pepsi. <laughs> so they put it there and then they covered that eye and uncovered the other eye and they asked the person to explain how that can of coke got there and the person said well i just went down the hall to the machine and i got that and i got the coke and i brought it back here that did not happen Mm -hmm. but this because there was that separation of and there's a tie between the eye like the right eye is tied to the left hemisphere the left eye is tied to the right hemisphere so there, there's this disconnect and to the degree that we have a dis, this sort of um, the potential for a disconnection within our own minds, even without having that um, mm-hmm. corpus colostinectomy. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's something about the way I think we think about things that sort of causes us to see something and then we create the story. We don't realize we're creating the story, but we do. And then that's, that's how we explain it. And I guess I'm saying all this because what that does, I believe, is it causes us to take more credit for the way things are, the way things were, and the way things will be than what we're due. 
Mm. We, we tend to put ourselves at the center or other people, uh, the, the other, um, the enemy or the friend or whatever ourselves. We tend to put that at, as the actor, you know, the, the agent that has control. Um, whereas maybe that, that from the very moment of, say, there being something rather than nothing, which we had absolutely nothing to do with. I think we can yeah. all agree with that. <laughs> and everything that unfolded from that point and the, com the complexity that emerged from the, those, that something and nothing, or what, you, in terms of information, maybe you could call it information and information. Um, that would, ex if they were to just interact perfectly, if there was this perfect balance of information and information, then there would be no contrast. There would be no information. Everything would be perfectly distributed <laughs> and smooth and no contrast, no gradient, no movement. It would be a dead universe, essentially. Um, so all the complexity that arose from that, because there wasn't a perfect balance, only a, a laws that seek balance, um, we, we didn't have anything to do with any of that, and or like, you know, you, Karen, you didn't have anything to do with creating yourself <laughs> and I didn't create myself. And yet here we are Indeed. thinking these thoughts and yep. right. we're, we're thinking these thoughts and, and talking about these things. And um, so yeah, I, I yeah. just, I got to tell you what I was thinking about this morning, because what you just said is so like mind blowingly connected. Um, I saw this. Uh, lecture on entropy and probabilities and and here's a quote from it the maximum entropy solution now this is when they're talking about all these formulas so it gets very complicated but but this was the underlying principle the maximum entropy solution assigns zero probabilities only when no other possibilities are allowed so when there's no other possibilities allowed, yeah. even a maximum entropy solution can assign zero probabilities. And, and that, okay. to me, that's kind of the picture of this completely spread out universe, right? Or, yes. or, or the crystal. Or um, if I go back to that lecture from Sharon Glotzer about uh, particle physics, when she was talking about when you remove all the space from the particles so that they're tightly constrained, they will self-organize into a crystalline structure, even though they are not crystals. These are just, um, I think they're synthetic particles. They just yeah. they put these particles of all of the same shape in a container and they take out all of the space so that it has its maximum constraint and in that situation, there's only one place for it to go, and it goes to self-organized crystal structure. And yes. so <clears throat> here's, here's what I wrote. <laughs> okay. <laughs> when no other possibilities are allowed, there is only one solution, or at least that's what he seems to say to me. And I wonder if this fits with the Glotzer lecture on particles self-organizing into a crystalline structure when in a maximum constraint. So God, in his goodness, allows us the minimum constraint so that there will be many possible solutions. And that will allow for maximum creativity, maximum information, and maximum individuality. Yeah. And, and, and part of the way I think that works out ties in with what Jordan Peterson always talks about when he discusses anomaly, mm -hmm. that it's the anomalies which work on many levels, all the way from macro all the way down to micro levels. Um, you can think of the anomaly that a, 
single-celled organism confronted at the beginning of time. <laughs> and, and that anomaly forced it to adapt and develop some new way of, of being so that it began to increase in its information and in its capacity. And then all the way up to who we are today, the kinds of anomalies that come into our lives that force us to adapt and to learn and to maybe maybe suffer or maybe just increase our strength through you know whatever whatever obstacles that we face in life cause us to grow so all of those anomalies come from somewhere yes yes right, right. Yes, yes. Come from somewhere. They're not. Yeah. They're, they're not accidental. I don't think. I think that they're perfectly suited to to meet the need of whatever is facing the anomaly for to grow. Like when Jordan Peterson talks about falling over into chaos or being courageous enough to move over into chaos, yeah. so that mm -hmm. you confront the dragon and. Um, rescuing the maiden or gather the gold or bring whatever treasures are hiding there and bring them back into your life um, to, to get rid of the restrictive, overly ordered system and, and help it to grow into something that's more flourishing and more balanced, yeah. then um, those are the anomalies that are growing us. They're not yeah. They're not usually easy and they're not usually pain free, <laughs> right? But um but it seems to me that the system that we're in allows for this level of creativity, where if we were in a tightly constrained system, mm -hmm. there would only be one solution. And and mm -hmm. this is what happens, I think, when um people become too rigid in their thinking, the constraint. Mm -hmm prevent mm -hmm. better solutions yes yes uh yeah there's so many so many things that are uh, <laughs> so many directions to take that what you're saying um the idea of gosh where to start just pick any thread <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, the, the 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 constraint I think is an interesting place to to look at because um, the constraint isn't between is between two, but that that two is um, like if you look at it in terms of information, it's zero and one, like the digital. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I like to look at the, I, what helps me to comprehend this is looking at the image and on a pixel by pixel basis. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, like a digital screen that's made up of pixels, like a TV screen, mm -hmm. each each pixel has the potential to contain information, which is just say let's. The only thing we're going to look at is black or white, mm -hmm. and we can say that black and white black is figure and white is ground. Okay. Um, or that's just one way to look at it. Mm -hmm. But before before it's filled, that pixel is filled with something. It's just the potential to be filled with black or white, with figure or ground. Before that, it's before it's filled with information or let's call it information you could say the black is information and the white is information or you could flip it around if you wanted to it doesn't really matter one's figure and one's ground but there's two that's the point two choices mm -hmm. and before that um, happens there's just the pure potential and and so to me that's the quantum reality that there's no there's nothing there and then when we look at it when we when when we look at it we are collapsing that probability wave um, which is the math is way beyond me how that happens i'm just sort of repeating what i've been told by people like or you know watched on youtube <laughs> like you know people like roger penrose talks about this a lot 
Um, but when we when we look at that, it collapses that probability wave, and it's either information or information. But the thing is, there's not just two pixels. There's there's many pixels. And so, what happens when you have three? If the if the laws of um, thermodynamics, let's just call it balance. The, the seeking of balance and, and complete perfect um, union so that there is no contrast, there is no movement. That's the way the physicists tell us that everything is headed towards and what it wants to be. What happens if you have three pixels and two choices? What happens to that third pixel? Well, you can't split that third one uh, and say, well, let's just say half of it's going to be information and half of it's going to be information because those two things annihilate each other. They can't exist in the same space, in the same pixel. They just cancel each other out. So the, the universe's answer to that is that it doesn't put any information in any place at any one time. It distributes that information of all the pixels of the universe at the Planck scale. It distributes it everywhere all at once. So it's never anywhere at, at one time until we look at it and then it, and then it is. Um, so that there's a, there, there's something about consciousness that interacts with matter mm -hmm. that um, I think, yeah, I guess that's a real metaphysical type of, of question. I'm not sure that there's proof <laughs> of any of that, but, um, no, but that's is, the way that's I like to look at it. That's inside my head, but I've not been able to articulate it as clearly as that. And what you just said, um, that, and that's one of the reasons that my, my picture of God is like so big, <laughs> you know, I mean, to, to contemplate the capacity to have a system like that, that's completely full of information that can be wherever it needs to be at any given moment, depending upon the dynamics of the system and depending upon the, the number of participants in the system, the number of active participants in the system at any given moment. Um, well, depending on everything, there's, there's so many yeah. things that are involved there. Um, but let me go back just a second to when you said with the laws of thermodynamics, when you come into complete balance, there's no movement. At this point, I think it'd be good to discuss balance a little bit because there's a lot there mm -hmm. that, that connects up to many other parts of life. So um, in one sense, when you think of complete balance where there's no movement you can think of a a little hill and on top of the hill there's a little round object and <laughs> it's perfectly balanced there it's not moving there's no movement but there's plenty of potential movement there right i mean it's yeah. just filled with maximum potential for movement there um but when I think of balance in art, I get I have a completely different picture of what balance is. Mm -hmm. So, so in art, you know, there's the seven elements of which all the art is composed, which is the line and size, shape, direction, color, value, texture. Those are the things of which the 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 piece of art is composed. But the way in which it's composed, um, in includes uh, such things as unity, variety, harmony, contrast, variation, gradation, repetition, and balance. Okay. And balance is really essential for, um, for a piece to be captivating to the viewer. Okay. okay? 
So, but balance does not come from, from everything being symmetrical or from everything being the same size uh, or from mm -hmm. being rigid or static. The balance comes from um, some of the, the important principles that are involved in that balance are unity with variety because there needs to be the right proportion of repetition and variation and gradation. Mm -hmm. And it also comes from the proportion of uh, color, the proportion of size, and, and to have the right proportion, you need to have dominance. So, um, Let's say that you're going to have a painting that's mostly cool colors, mostly blues and lavenders. Okay. Of course, you want to have some variation, some gradation in those blues, and, and you want to have some things going on in that cool section. Mm -hmm. but, but it's mostly cool. Okay. But then the focal point is usually something that is the opposite. And okay. it's much smaller, much smaller on a scale of at least 80-20. Or maybe okay. the focal point is 5% and then there's some intermediate that's another 15% and then the dominant is, what would that be, 80, 80%, okay? Okay. So, so you have mostly blues and lavenders. You're going to have some little hot orange intricate thing. Mm -hmm. You probably have touches of orange and gold elsewhere in the blues, but it's mostly dominantly cool and a little bit of this warm gives you a focal point, a place to look. So it's the small, different thing that gets the focus. Okay. That's what creates the balance with the big dominant thing. And that's true in color, it's true in size, you know, just the amount of real estate that's covered by something. Mm -hmm. um, every aspect, there has to be that situation with dominance and focal point. And this shows up in politics, in economics, in, in physics, right? It shows up everywhere. Yeah, interesting. Uh, yeah, it seems like there's, when you talk about being at the top of a hill and then there's the bottom of the hill mm -hmm. and the potential for movement that's there. Mm -hmm. um, when you, and the, the, the reason the potential for movement is there is because there's a contrast between what's low and what's high or what's small and what's large or what's dark and what's vibrant. Um, mm. Ah, oh, so that, the, that's a good insight, yeah. That's a really, that's a Jungian type of uh, concept, I think, because he talks about the gradient of, of meaning, the gradient of the psyche. Mm -hmm. and, um, I'm not sure that that's original to him, but that's where I've heard the context that I've heard that discussed. Who, who is that? Carl Jung. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there's, maybe there's something about and it wouldn't surprise me at all. It would make perfect sense that visually, when we when we regard something and appreciate it visually, what we think of it, how it makes us feel, the affect that it evokes, mm -hmm. has a, it, we're not like just judging this separate other piece of art. It's actually doing something to us. It's evoking some sort of gradient within us mm -hmm. that's that's reflective of the gradient that's on the canvas. And so I'm not sure from what you're saying if there's like a way to, or if people have gone through and like calculated the exact, you know, contrast or the, the exact size difference and the exact, um, you know, all those aspects that are different, you know, to, to mm -hmm. evoke the, um, what you might call balance or the, the right kind of balance. Well, they actually did do some calculation, okay. at least of the, the uh, pleasing proportions of the rectangle mm -hmm. um, back during, I think it goes back as far as the Renaissance, maybe even further back. Okay. Where they, they determined the correct proportion of the rectangle 
and they determined that based on um, is that the golden ratio? It's the golden ratio, and it's it's one point six one eight, which is the ratio between the long side and the short side. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's the ratio between the long side and the combination of the long side and the short side. I don't remember. <laughs> I, I don't remember how exactly they calculated it, but yeah. but they use that to calculate a lot of different things. And and I believe that Fibonacci came later, but the Fibonacci sequence, which is a number added, two numbers add up to the next number. So yeah. 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 30, mm -hmm. 34. And on and on and on. And on and on and on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that the ratio that... When, when that settles down, when it gets to a stable ratio, it's exactly 1.618. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Fibonacci sequence shows up in every imaginable aspect of the natural world in, yeah. the, um, in the way that flowers are constructed and pineapple swirls and pine cone whorls and um, the way that leaves are shaped around branches and it shows up everywhere and and that weirdly enough the golden ratio shows up in a lot of places in math and physics where you would least expect it to show up and why is that and it, it because there's some perfect proportionality there so balance is and i think this is true i mean i don't know a lot about physics because i was a bad girl that never took it in high school or college <laughs> okay. but but I do believe I understand that um, balance isn't just to have two things that are of equal weight, although that's one way that it's described in, you know, yeah. in the dictionary. But if, if I had a seesaw and I had a person of one weight on one side, couldn't a person of a smaller weight affect the movement of the seesaw if they jump on the other side rather than just sit there? Yeah, yeah. So it's also the momentum and the speed and all of that also combines with the weight to produce balance, yeah. right? Yeah, or, and, or you could, you know, so also say, also say just the mass. Like if you had a really small object with a lot of mass, it would be, mm -hmm. it would balance out even though it was visually, it looks smaller. Yes. If, if it was much more dense, it would, you know, have that same balancing effect. Maybe there's, you know, something applicable there to, to, um, the interplay of different elements of the of art like color uh, intensity and vibrancy and size mm -hmm. and things like that that all all sort of interplay analogously to that teeter-totter situation to balance things but there's also a you know back to the question of like to say something is balanced is really to say something about how it's being perceived um, how it what it does to the to the perceiver to the viewer that has that affect that balances that the viewer so that could be um, if you if you imagine that the same properties that exist in nature the same symmetries the same principles of balance and order and structure extend to the nature that is that that we are our body mind mm -hmm. um, not just maybe the the mind and the neural connections and all that but the whole the whole package um that there's something about within us that is designed according to that exact same sense of balance then it would make sense that the you know when we see that in nature we feel in resonance we feel in harmony with that we there's something that's affected in us and what when we see but it's you know it's not just about looking at uh, things that have the fibonacci or the golden ratio because you know our our minds aren't perfectly geometric <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're not they're they are chaotic the nature of our mind body is 
is much more complex and, and chaos just meaning that there is order there but it's just so complex that we can't make heads nor tails of it <laughs> mm -hmm. in the in the time frame that we can look at it all we can see is like you know a snapshot and it looks like we call it chaos but it actually is not disordered it is not random um it's just unknown, unknown yeah. to us, right? It's unknown to us because of our limited perspective in time and space mm -hmm. that we're looking at it. But there's something about going back to your original statement or comment on Paul Vanderclay's um, comment that he made about the material world representing um, information what, would you say that again? What was it? That materiality is a medium of communication. A medium of communication. Yeah. So, yeah. So whether it's, um, so the, the easy part, I guess, is when we see a, a square or a circle or a triangle or one of the platonic solids or something like that, and our minds just look at that and we go, oh, you know, that's easy. <laughs> uh -huh. But when we see chaos, when we see things that aren't easily put into a category or a, is this the other, you know, is this a danger, a threat? Is this, what is this? It's the unknown, like you said. Um, then our, our minds have to do some work. And typically I think what our minds tend to do is they want to fit a square or a circle or a rectangle or something very, ordered and structured onto that whether it goes or not <laughs> mm -hmm. and we'll we'll look and we'll we'll look for that order and we'll you know by gosh make it fit and um there's there's something about you know politics and e e uh, economics and all that stuff that is influenced by the rigid nature of um the desire to concretize meaning in terms of simpleness, simplicity, mm -hmm. preconceived patterns or templates of like political philosophy or what have you. Yeah, that exactly. Completely, so it hardens, when it hardens into an ideology because we, we yes. put too much order, too many boundaries around it. Yes, yeah. And it's, e it's, it's easy, but it doesn't serve us. It's, it's actually dead. It's actually a dead it because there's the only thing that's living is the thing that ha is happening right now and, and is just on the cusp of happening and that's mm -hmm. completely unpredictable and it's completely new novel um and of course we have to to a certain extent you know and it serves us to organize things into structures and and to not just kind of like live in chaos all the time. But I think it's important that we maintain an open eye to chaos and, uh, and welcome chaos and we welcome the anomalies that emerge as information that we don't know mm -hmm. <laughs> and that is trying to teach us something. And oftentimes there's suffering there and, and pain and it's not pleasant, but it's, yeah, I, I just really think that there's, um, to me, it's undeniable that there's um, there's a structure and an order that's being communicated, <laughs> and I don't, not by aliens or anything like that necessarily, uh -huh. but by nature, by material, by the materiality, the very materiality of of the world. There's there's always something to see if we are willing to be open to look. Well, one of the things that Jordan Peterson said, I think when he was having a discussion with Roger Scruton, he said that we come up against the transcendent most often when we fall into error. Hmm. And, uh, and for me, that tied together with this idea that um, 
Well, it, it connects up a little bit with another thing that Paul Vanderclay said, which I've been pondering a lot, and that is reality is that which governs. Mm -hmm. Because when we bump up against reality, <laughs> we sort of face the truth, right? <laughs> you know, um, you can think that you're safe in your little um, ideological bubble, and and then something will happen, and cognitive dissonance sets in and, and you're like wait a minute mm -hmm. the world isn't the way i thought it was it's really much more complex which at first is a very scary thought but eventually that becomes a very beautiful thought that the world is very much more complex than i thought and um and and even though it Reality is so complex and in some ways can look terrifying in its chaotic aspect. It's also that which provides all the opportunities. I mean, if, if, if reality were any way other than what it is, we would be more highly constrained. We would be more um, reduced in our, our potential and our opportunities. So yeah um, well to, as it is it's the the constraint is perfect because it it allows for an infinite variety with within within the boundary of zero and one of you know information in it and information uh -huh. <laughs> between those two states of say the of the abyss and the void is another way to look at it there's infinite potential so can we go back to your comment earlier about symbol as being different than sign? Um, mm. We're saying that a, a sign gives us a specific piece of information, but a symbol leaves open to interpretation. And, um, mm -hmm. and I was listening to a discussion between Paul Vanderclay and somebody whose name I forget uh, yesterday. And they were talking about how um, language used to be much more poetic in nature and um, mm. writings used to be much more poetic in nature. And in the last few hundred years, and increasingly so, we're becoming more and more scientific in our language. So that scientific language is very precise and doesn't leave much wiggle room for what it means. But mm. poetic language, leaves a space open for the way i see it i mean even if i look at um the word of god in the bible it was written um in such a way that it leaves room for my growth it leaves room for my understanding to grow as my capacity to understand the world grows and um, it leaves room for us as a, as a human um, all of humanity as we grow in our historical knowledge and our historical experience it leaves room for us to grow in our understanding also of what it means so the poetic knowledge, the poetic language that's in the book of John, when it talks about in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. When you go back and look at that in the original Greek, it actually uses terminology that is, does not seem unfamiliar with quantum physics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But before we knew about quantum physics, it wouldn't have said that to us. But now we know about quantum physics, so now we can understand that at a much deeper level than we understood it before. Yes. So poetic language leaves room like this. And very much like art, when I paint a painting, I often don't know what it is I'm trying to express. But I get it on the canvas, and then someone comes and looks at it, and it says something to them at a level that they find hard putting into words. So we're communicating with each other, but we're communicating with each other at a level that can't be put into 
at least cannot be put into scientific language, maybe yes, yes. only into poetic language. Yeah, right. And I, I think that's exactly the, the, the function of the symbol, visually speaking. Mm -hmm. the, the function of it, um, the written word, it, the, the equivalent there would be the, the, the metaphor. Um, would be you know the written sort of the written version of that or the spoken mm -hmm. narrative version of that but i think it's it's conveying this information that's an implicit information implicit knowledge that cannot be put into words directly mm -hmm. can only be conveyed through the symbol or through the metaphor and there's something about these symbols and metaphors that are timeless in the sense that they come from the future in a way they're <laughs> they, they they'll never be outdated because they they come from a place beyond time another is another way to look at it um and, and i think that if you could look at certain aspects of theoretical physics and it's way beyond my understanding but you know there are people that work in that in that field that are trying to work around this idea of the you know the arrow of time and the, the backwards causality that is um potential in the quantum universe can that be the topic for our next discussion <laughs> yeah sure we have to do i have to look up some uh do some research on it but the arrow of time and the backwards causality i'm looking forward to it Okay, me too, Karen. It's been great talking with you, Alex. Yeah, it's been really good. Again, I will, I will send you this and you can check it out and see if it's okay with you. And then if it is, I'll publish. Oh, it's fine. Okay. okay. Um, if you have any, any links that you would like me to include in the, in the description portion, um, any lectures or videos that were interesting to you or articles, that would be great. Yeah. Okay, great. I'll, I'll look into that. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.